Welcome to the Big Suey, a podcast exclusive. Uh, risky move. Just when you thought the show could not be more diluted. Walk the plank. Bam. Uh, no more free Disney trips. Now here's the marching band of nowhere. Matey. Fat face. Uh, dance been stress eating. And the habitual liar. Uh, Stu got can't be trusted. The Big Suey. Yo ho, yo ho, a pirate radio life for me. What a fun and fascinating game last night. And we bring in Amin El Hassan now because there are a number of things I want to discuss with him. But let's start with, can you allow that play at the rim with that amount of time left on the clock? Game winners are never at the rim like that, Amin. Yeah, you know, the funny thing was before that play was drawn up, and by the way, as Monty Williams pointed out, that was a play the Suns actually ran years ago when Jay Triano was the head coach. I remember watching that game against Memphis where they did it for uh, Tyson Chandler. But uh, before that play was drawn up, I was thinking about the power of the decoy. And I thought back to the, a play that the Warriors ran against the Clippers, ironically enough, a couple of years ago where Steph Curry is coming off a Draymond Green screen and Andre Guadalla is the inbound man who's on the baseline. And the guy guarding Steph, the guy guarding Draymond, and the guy guarding the inbound all jump towards Steph where, where Steph was. So then Draymond Green just slipped and he goes and, he, and Iguodala passes him. It's a wide open layup. And everyone's like, how could you give that up? How could you give up a layup? You're supposed to protect the basket above everything. And the answer is simple. Steph Curry demanded so much respect and attention wherever he was on the floor that everybody had in their brain, there's no chance we're going to let him beat us. Well, fast forward to last night, I'm thinking the same thing about Devin Booker. And lo and behold, you got uh, you got um, Zubac kind of not being as quick to the basket as he was because he had to stay What was Batum? What was Batum Batum, Batum basically said, Booker's not going to beat us. And what, what Batum is supposed to do is most teams in that situation, almost all teams, I should say, switch everything. So as soon as there's a screen, we just switch. We just switch. But Batum's saying, I'm not switching because I know that guy. What you should do if you're not a switching team is as the guy comes off, you bump him. You tag him as he's coming along just so he doesn't have like a full head of steam. Batum doesn't do that either because he's worried that split second of him doing this equals Booker going that way and then pop out shot and what what were you doing the best player on the floor was wide open so Batum stays hugged up against Booker and indeed almost screens his own man in the process letting a, a wide open uh, now to, to Zubac's credit he he recovered in time he just you know he, <laughs> he's he, not he's as Zubac. The under <laughs> he's, yeah, he's Zubac <laughs> <laughs> to his credit uh, he tried really hard but he's Zubac Exactly. And then the, th- the third element of this is DeMarcus Cousins. Look at how he's standing. He's guarding the inbound. Like, I'm not letting this ball get out to the three point line over here. Buddy, they got 0.9 seconds left. You have to shade towards the basket. But again, he's thinking in his mind, Devin Booker's getting this ball. That was a great pass by Crowder. It was a great finish by Ayton. But unsung hero in all this is Devin Booker because. The respect he commanded from the defense is what allowed all that to happen. I erred in not telling the audience that may not have seen what I'm talking about. With nine-tenths of a second left, DeAndre Ayton won the game last night with a dunk after Paul George missed two free throws. Felt so bad for Paul George. But have a lot of questions for you and your expertise, I mean. First of all, the last 90 seconds of that basketball game took damn near 35 real-time minutes because mm-hmm. of all the reviews and the replays and getting stuff wrong, even with the technology. What the hell? Like, that can't be. That just can't be. What did you think got wrong? Wasn't the ball off of Patrick Beverly? No, it, it, it was. Look, it was the most technical of technicalities. If we had replay 10 years ago, it would have been off of Beverly. But the reality is the technology was so good that we saw Beverly dislodge the ball, but Booker continue to dribble. So there is a point where Beverly's hand is gone. He's touched. It's gone. And Booker still is in contact with the ball. It is the most splitting of hairs out of bounds call, but it is accurate. It was a right call. Now, you can you can argue that, you know, the, like Van Gundy did, the spirit of the law is that he's the reason why we're not a bounce. We don't play spirit of the law out here. Uh, we play the law. So 
I mean, that that was a good we call. Play, we but played the law in the last two minutes. The rest of the look, game, the rest of the game, it's off Beverly. The rest of time, yeah. it's off Beverly. Yeah, because the rest of the time, rest of the game, we don't have the time to sit there for 35 minutes watching people watch TV. And that's the big thing here is uh, I've said this for a while. Look, everyone wants replay. If you get rid of replay, all that's going to happen is the audiences at home are going to see who really touched it last or who really was inside this chart circle. But the refs don't have that to their disposal we're just going to say oh how awful it is so replay is here to stay but is there any way we can speed some of this stuff up that's the question can we speed some of this stuff up and the the reality is that call beverly uh the the beverly call was made by secaucus it wasn't made by uh by scott foster and his crew but my thing is this once there's a like an inkling before anyone on the court plunges or anything, someone in Secaucus has to start reviewing it so that by the time those guys get to the headset, put their headsets on screens up, they're like, yeah, it was out of bounds on him. OK, cool. Thank you. But this thing where they don't start or the, the, the start time is delayed or they're taking their sweet time over there, it has to be speeded up. And I think that's something the league should look at. I hate that a game that ends that way. And I love to celebrate athletic achievement, but I hate that roiling within me is the combination of this. This isn't a real Western Conference Finals. If you're going to give me no Chris Paul and no Kawhi, those are two above average teams that are a little bit broken. And so they're sort of wheezing against each other toward the finish line in a league of attrition. And then it takes 35 goddamn minutes to finish the game. And then when you get the winner, it's still a bunch of people milling about and Boogie Cousins pushing somebody and you're still not sure what the hell happened. And because you're so used to the replay over the last 35 minutes, you're expecting it again now for an interminable amount of time before you actually even know the result or can go to sleep. Right. And and I think that the funny thing is nobody seems to react to Devin Book against Chef by Boogie Cousins. Like that happened and not Mike Breen and, and Jeff Van Gundy and, and Mark Jackson, not the refs, not anyone, even the like the Suns, like there's a staffer who kind of jumped in to make sure Devin Booker doesn't get ejected or suspended for the next game. But there really was no, hey, hey, he, he just shoved him. He could have beheaded him with a samurai sword and there was so much going on that nobody would have noticed it. It was definitely the scene from Anchorman, right? Like Brick could have stabbed somebody with a trident, right? And and nothing. Everyone would just be like, "Whoa, that, that <laughs> got out of hand." We gotta go. We gotta go to replay. We'll we'll let the we'll let the NBA deal with this when it goes. You know, when Boogie's gonna get suspended for that, correct? Yeah, he's got to. I mean, like I, I just it was just such an obvious lack of poise and and out of context. Like Booker's smiling, so clearly he's saying something about what's up now, and. Cousins lost his cool and he shoved him. I'm like, I, that's for a guy who's that, you know, 10 years, 11 years in his career to fall for the, the banana and the tailpipe is kind of ridiculous. The one other thing that I thought uh, was interesting is that um, you said like, oh, this, this is, doesn't feel right because these two teams are shorthanded or whatever. Our buddy Tom Habistro has written about this, about champion to have an asterisk, right? Because the injuries or whatever happened. And he said, yes, they're absolutely our asterisk champions. And then he proceeded to list every single champion in the history of the NBA because the reality is every year people are hurt, people are sick, people get suspended, people, whatever happens, and someone who didn't have that stuff happen to them benefits as a result. I still remember 2015 when the Warriors did it. People pointed out, well, I mean, it wasn't just the, there was a, 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 I think an injury with the, the Grizzlies series. And then there was someone in the Rocket series who wasn't quite there. And you know, there was something in every single series they played where they weren't quite full strength. And people were like, and of course, the Cavs didn't have Kevin Love and Kyrie Irving. So I oh, agree. Like, oh. But what, what I'm saying is if I make these the rosters for a full season, those are both 45 win teams we're watching in the Western oh, Conference Finals or, or, without, or less. Yeah. Yes, without Chris Paul, what the first two games of that series that I'm watching, I'm watching two teams that are above average basketball teams, but not by much. They're not like final four teams without those players involved. And so the yeah. well, whatever, it doesn't matter. Yeah. That game yeah. last night was a fun ending and a ridiculous ending. You mentioned the Jay Crowder pass. God, he was so cool and calm about that. And it's because he spent four decades in the playoffs. <laughs> that and also it's the easiest alley-oop pass which is shoot it 
right? <laughs> like, right? Like most alley oop passes, you have to place it somewhere not quite above the rim because if it's directly above the rim, it's goaltending, right? For him, it's just like anywhere in the vicinity of the basket, just throw it up there. And when the guy guarding the inbound, who's specifically there to make it hard because he's 6'10 with long arms, is shading you this way, giving you a direct line uh, line of sight towards the basket, it makes it a little easier. And then you're throwing it to a pogo stick who's jumping over like a boulder, basically. Give me your top five guys in the league that it's easiest to throw a lob to because I love that the 74-year-old Aiton is one of those guys. I know he's not 74 years old, but uh, in terms of athleticism, like it, it really is absurd to see someone that size be able to move like that. All right. In no particular order, I would say Giannis. Uh, I would say Anthony Davis. I would say I would say Rudy Gobert just because the length. I mean, like seven, nine. What are you going to do about that? Um, let's see who else we've got. Uh, Aiton's not going to crack your top five. Eight, no, Aiton's in there. Aiton's, Aiton's definitely in there because because the thing about him is it's not just that he's got good hands and he can jump, but he's really live and mobile out there, right? He's not he's not rumbling to get there. He can it's all fast slither. twitch. It's all fast yep. twitch muscle fiber. All of it. Yep. And let's see. Let me pick one more. I got five, right? I gotta get to five. Or you could do it like Stugatz and just put twelve in there. Twelve <laughs> in your top five. If we can stop at four if you want. Uh no no. I I'll throw you know who I'll th- throw in there? I'll throw in John Collins. John Collins is pretty good too. What else did you find interesting about that game last night? Well, I mean, for all the people who said, oh, see, Paul George quieted the critics, like picked a hell of a time. To... I mean, and that's that's going to be his legacy, uh, Dan, forever. Is It's one of those things where even after you've kind of like got no, it's like, it's, you know, not to be. For those who don't be, know, for, for yeah. those who don't know, Paul George right before all that with eight seconds left up one missed two free throws that would have put yeah. them up three. And, and didn't have a great shooting game overall. He had a couple of buckets in the fourth quarter where it looked like, okay, he, he could put this thing away. And, and he didn't play great for most of the game, but he played great when it counted and bang, uh, game over. And instead uh, he misses those two free throws. To miss two, missing one would have already kind of had people arching an eyebrow. Missing two was really kind of a death sentence for him. And the reality is this, and not to be, I don't want to be flippant about this, but it's like someone who's a recovering alcoholic, right? Anytime you see them around a bar, there was, oh, I thought, I thought, even if you've had 30 years of sobriety, there's gonna be, I thought, oh, don't get around there. That's what everyone's going to say. And with Paul George, it's the same thing. Right. No matter what he does from here on out his career, anytime there is a misstep towards the end, people are going to remember and they're going to hold that against him. I'm not generally the guy who goes choker, 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 but the free throw line gives you an awful time, an awful lot of time to think. And that is one of the places where muscle memory is not helping you. You're up there. If your doubts, <laughs> if, if there's doubt in your head, that's a pretty decent place for it to make an appearance. Yeah, and especially when because it gives you the moment to, first of all, obviously the crowd and everything, but also to understand the stakes. If I hit these, the game is over. It'll be really hard for them to do it. Then it's like you missed the first one. Like, damn, well, I've given them a little bit of a window, but still, if I hit this one, it's over. It's for all intents and purposes. That's a tough night of sleep. Uh, Last question before I get you out of here and we bring in David Sampson because some cool baseball stuff happened last night. I have a uh, simple, complicated question. Cameron Payne. What the hell? <laughs> well, I mean, that's that's the story that we tell time and time and time again in this league. It's that LeBron, Kevin Durant, Steph Curry, Giannis, James Harden, you put them anywhere, they're going to be great, and their team is going to do reasonably well. And then for the vast majority of everybody else, and that includes stars in there, that includes all stars in that list, it all depends on where I am. Who do I play for? Who do I play with? How do you, how do you use me? How, how am I being coached? right? Everyone is very context dependent. So there are guys who can look like not NBA players and then put them in the right situation with the right kind of support system, 29 points, nine assists in a conference finals game. And that's Cameron Payne. And, I, and I'll be the first to say, I was one of the guys that I don't think Cameron Payne's an NBA player. I think he's a novelty act. I think he's a guy who dances with Russell Westbrook before games and he appears to be a very good teammate that everyone likes, but you know, he's just that guy. Uh, and then over the last, literally over the last eight months or so, because remember he was in China, he came back to play in the bubble for the Suns, 
And that's where it kind of came back together for him. Uh, and then this year, obviously, playing there, having Chris Paul as a teammate and a mentor and someone talking him through these things, having Monty Williams, who I believe he had played for as an assistant coach in Oklahoma City. There was a relationship there. And then having some amount of success it, during the regular season with regular minutes and regular appearances, it all got him to the stage right here. Yes or no question. I'm not going to let you elaborate. You'll elaborate next time. Yes or no question. Kevin Durant is better than Kobe Bryant. Yes. We will talk to you again, sir. Always appreciate your expertise. Again, Cinephobe is something you need to be checking out. I'm not sure what it is. What is Cinephobe? Oh, man. I'm glad you asked. Cinephobe is the podcast where Zach Harper and I review movies that are poorly rated on Rotten Tomatoes and try to ascertain whether they are accurately poorly rated or perhaps just perhaps like Cameron Payne, they didn't get a fair shake. That's Cinephobe wherever you get podcasts. I heard my wife wandering around the house the other day talking about John Travolta month. I don't know oh, what's happening yes. there, but I, <laughs> I'm, I, I'm very excited about whatever it is going to take place there. John Travolta month. Thank you. I mean, always appreciate your expertise, sir. R- really quick. I just want to say this week's episode is Nick Fury, agent of shield. It's a Marvel movie. And everyone says, Oh, I didn't know they made one with Samuel Jackson. They didn't. They made one 20 years ago with David Hasselhoff. You won't be disappointed. Samson, you've got no use for these Marvel movies, these superhero movies, right? You don't like any of them? Amin's done a whole month of this stuff. I hadn't seen any of them, and now I've seen them all. So I actually enjoyed each one of them, shockingly. It's just popcorn. It's popcorn for me. I'm surprised to hear you say that you've gotten sucked into that hole. That's Insomnia Theater? Uh, it's ex- not only, it's Insomnia Theater and it's FOMO because it it where I was working at CBS Sports HQ, I think was maybe is... I guess Uh, everyone was talking about it in the studio pre COVID and I hadn't seen one of them and I got absolutely shamed. So once the quarantine started, I watched every single one in order, might I add. Nothing personal is something you need to be checking out. We've told you a number of different times that no executive speaks this plainly cuts through all of it. I got a message from Dominique Foxworth based on some of the things that you said last week about how much he loves you just because of how you were guffawing at whatever it is. I don't even remember because every week something happens, but you were just so guffawing at the idea of corporations having moralities, I guess, or 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 t- teams trying not to cheat because this is why I bring you in today. I was was laughing out loud at how immature all these baseball players are, which is basically just Sergio Romo and Max Scherzer. Okay, you're going to question me? Here's my penis. You guys want to see my penis? I'm going to show you my penis on television. How's that baseball? Like, it's so immature, all of it. And then Girardi, the Marine, marches out. I expect him to, you know, with a bayonet, like stab three players. Like, what did you make of everything that was happening last night? I actually felt badly for my old friend, Mike Hill, because his name is associated with this and it shouldn't be because it has nothing to do with him. He's sort of the implementer. It's sort of like blaming Winningham for something that you want to do on the pirate ship that gets screwed up. And this has been a total screw up. And the reason is that it's become part of the collective bargaining negotiations. And that's what the fans don't understand. The reason why Max Scherzer put on the show he put on is not because he doesn't use sticky substances. He does. The reason why he put on the show is he's so angry that the rule is that he can't use anything. And what we should focus on is his quote where he said, hey, I almost hit somebody in the head with a 95er because I couldn't grab the ball. I'm going to my hair. I'm trying to get any sort of sweat I can. And Girardi lost his mind saying, why is he going to his hair so often? And this is what Girardi did. We didn't like it when he did it with the Marlins. He was a first year manager. Now he's a bit of a veteran, but he always is trying to gain a little advantage by catching other players doing things. But his house is so very, very glass. And every manager's team is using foreign substances. So they shouldn't be doing what Girardi did ever. What are the things from last night? And just to recap, for those who haven't seen it, you want to recap the more interesting things from last night? Because Romo, later that night, Romo did the same thing that Scherzer did, which is he's offering his ump- the umpire, takes off his belt and is offering, here, you want to see, you want to see my penis too? Well, he actually did pull his pants down, but having been in a clubhouse for so many years, I can tell you that not one player has ever gone commando. So when Sergio Romo took his pants down, there was no penis risk whatsoever. 
So I just want to make sure that everyone is okay with that because there was not anything that you're describing. That said, what the players are trying to do is they're trying to show up MLB, not the umpires, but it ends up showing up the umpires because they're acting so disrespectfully. Just let yourself get checked if that those are the rules that are going to change eventually. Let yourself get checked and move on. But remember who Scherzer's agent is. Do you know who it is? Guess. Boris, I'm sure. It's Boris. So what Scott Boris does as an agent, understanding that if this rule is going to be part of the negotiations, which it is, the players do not want to give in even an inch before they sit at the table and try to get something back for allowing substances to be taken away. So he had his players and he communicates with his players en masse. What that means is he's got a stable of players, whether it's Zach Gallen or Scherzer or Garrett Cole, and he communicates with them telling them exactly how to act in certain situations. And then he'll assign different parts like he's the maestro in a play. I want you to say this publicly. I want you to act totally pissed off publicly. I want you to throw your hat down in disgust and say that we deserve a seat at the table. So he he will write out a play. I don't want to call him Shakespeare. I really don't want to do that, actually. But that's what we saw last night. And it really doesn't make baseball look good at all, does it? Well, I was trying to think, and I don't want to be prisoner of the moment here, but when Sergio Romo is dropping his pants and throwing his belt at the umpire's feet, I was trying to think off the top of my head, like, when's the last time I saw something that just looked this publicly embarrassing, where everyone's behaving like children and there's a rebellion here that is, you know, it's it's tantrums, the tantrums in the terrible twos. Like, these are not, this, these are not adult behaviors. But but again, I want you to look at it from a slightly different perspective. They're not doing it to throw tantrums. They're doing it to make a point. And when kids throw tantrums, often they don't know what their point is. And often they don't know what their goal is other than wanting more dessert, maybe, and not wanting to go to bed. But what these players are doing, there is no child in it. It is very pointed what they're doing. And the, again, I want to reiterate, the reason they're doing this is for leverage when it comes to negotiating the new agreement. You should be concerned as a baseball fan, not that they're acting like two-year-olds. You should be concerned that the owners and the players are so far apart in even something as simple as how to check for substances that when it comes to the real meaty issues, do you like that one? I mean, meaty issues that we can then get something accomplished. But I, I'm just afraid that this is going the wrong direction completely. When, when's the last time you saw something just visually, the optics of something that you were that embarrassed for a sport, you the sport you care about there? Does it have to be in? I was very, very embarrassed when Pedro Martinez went after Don Zimmer. Yeah, that's in the realm. OK, so Pedro Martinez beating up an old man is in the realm of what it is that we saw last night, where Don Zimmer is rolling around on the floor. You're worried about his hip because he's 85 years old and he's just been thrown to the ground by 164 pound Pedro Martinez. But you're you're it, I, I'm not comparing that because I was embarrassed when that happened for the sport last night. I was not embarrassed. I was sad. And so I want to draw that distinction if you'll let me. Sad just because negotiating, you don't normally get emotional about these things. Sad? <laughs> yeah, because I'm watching the sport and I'm watching people who are not involved in the game have the reaction that you're having. And the reaction that you're having is that you think it's embarrassing. I understand what's going on behind the scenes. I just wish they would have they would have done it a different way. They would have manifested their distrust and anger in a different way. What happened with Pedro and Don Zimmer is, and that was the first thing that came to my head, that was part of a baseball brawl. I'm really, I really don't care much over my 18 years. I didn't mind when there were brawls. I didn't mind when players were going after each other. I enjoyed that, actually. One of my great memories is Miguel Olivo charging third base against the Mets, the third baseman, and how much I actually love that. But when coaches are involved, I, I don't like that. It reminded me a little bit of the malice in the palace when fans involved. It's just so inappropriate that that embarrassed me. Last night, I was, I was sad. I'll give you that. I had an emotion of sadness that baseball is heading toward this absolute crisis here in a couple of months. I'm also guessing that that's the Michael Hill you're dying on. There's some emotion there for you because it's your guy in the middle of it who's at the center of the embarrassment and it's not really his fault. 
I thought about that too. And I actually did not contact him last night because I didn't want to be that guy. He's got so many people doing that to him right now. And I understand why Michael Hill took that job because he didn't get another GM job and baseball wanted him around still. And he's really good at what he does. And he should be a candidate for other GM jobs as they open next season. But he took over for a guy named Chris Young. I don't know if you know that name. He's a former pitcher who was running on-field operations last year. And he then became the assistant GM in Texas. He may have, they may have named him GM, but he's really like the assistant GM. So Mike Hill inherits this situation. And now Rob Manford chooses to use foreign substances as a sword when it comes to the collective bargaining agreement. And there's no choice. Mike Hill was told, you're going to sign this memo. You're going to be a part of enforcing it. And it's just not a great situation for him because these are all of his, don't forget, all the GMs, all the managers, all the players, he knows them all. They're his, I can't think of the word because it's early, uh, all of his compatriots, all of the people he works with. If you want more on this, you should. David Sampson, nothing personal. Check it out. He'll be with us tomorrow again. Anything else from last night that you think is worth noting that because it was it was a lot of stuff happening last night as this comes to a head. What what I thought was a pretty silly controversy, what I thought was a cheating scandal I'm numb to now continues to escalate. Yeah, I've got several more minutes on this, but to do that, you're going to have to download nothing personal today. Very good. Nothing personal and xenophobe. Anything about the movies you guys care to discuss here? If you want to intermingle here before you leave, I don't know, Samson, if you're also uh, jealous and rage filled that Amin has a movie podcast that is sort of near our sphere uh, along with Adnan's. I mean, I've been dying to ask you this because to me, the biggest problem I have is I don't have enough hours in the day. And is this a little niche that you always dreamt of that you want to watch movies that are poorly rated and see whether or not that that's how it's that's how it should be? Because do you then not watch all of the great movies that are out there because you're spending so much time watching crap? Oh, no, it's quite the opposite. So I love watching good movies now, but it, it's also ruined some good movies for me because they often lean on the same devices that bad movies do. For instance, exposition, overly expository dialogue. I, I can't unsee it now it's whenever i see it i see people oh you're not talking you're just trying to explain to us what's happening and that that sticks out but the reality is now i have bad movies that i see on my guide that i want to watch and i say well no uh probably should wait for instance it's a travolta movie that i wanted to watch and i said on second thought let me hold off for travolta month so this is this is my burden I'm fascinated by your choice. I think it's an interesting podcast, but if you want to hear reviews that are in depth and interesting for shows to watch, I also encourage you to check out the dinghy. Nothing personal. We're doing some stuff there. Uh, I think today I'm reviewing it. I reviewed wrath of man yesterday. Did you check that one out? Not yet. What is right? What's which one that's is right? Statham, that's Statham oh. being Statham. <laughs> and in a way that I found unfortunate because it erases all the guy Richie and focuses on way too much Statham. So see, I mean, you really I'm not sure what your position is on the ship because that's the review, right? Statham being Statham. And it, I watched it because it's a guy Richie movie. I like Jason Statham just fine. But where was Guy Ritchie? He totally sold out. So what I tried to discern is how much money he got paid during the pandemic to do Wrath of Man or a pre-pandemic because there was no Guy Ritchie to be found. It was formulaic. I was interested in it. I thought it was fine. Seeing Josh Hartnett made me smile. But other than that, I did not find it to be a movie that was worthy. And I don't even look at Rotten Tomatoes because I don't read reviews before I watch a movie because I think it ruins it. And I don't want to hear what other people have to say. So I actually don't even know how that was reviewed. So I don't know if you'll get a chance to see it. Yeah. So we actually don't read the reviews until after we've seen the movie. But we do know the overall score. And for Wrath of Man, the Rotten Tomatoes score is actually pretty positive. 66 percent from the critics. And let's see what the audience has it as. I was yeah. so bummed. I just saw the preview and I could tell, wait a minute, one of the 10 directors for whom I will stop and watch a movie has been erased by this particular actor. This particular genre of actor it bothered me. You got that from just the trailer, Dan? Yes. yes. So you haven't seen it? I haven't. No, I saw the trailer and I was like, wait a minute, there's no Guy Ritchie in here. Like, I I mean, the trailer was long enough to, to deduce that. Yes, I didn't need the actual movie. The trailer was enough to say, I am not watching this. There's no Guy Ritchie in it.
it's a total nightmare for a studio. What you just said that you judged your entire view of a movie off the trailer and you ended up being right, which is going to inform your behavior going forward. Not which is only the that, not, thing. not only that on a director that I will stop for a director that has made like, there are like 10 of those. There aren't very many that I will watch everything that he makes. And this was one that I was like, no, nah, I'm drawing the line here. I'm not doing this for Statham. That's a nightmare. <laughs> it's so bad what you're saying because <laughs> No, but anyway. I'm not the audience for that movie anyway. Yeah, not, hey, the audience score on Rotten Tomatoes, 90%. Trust me, the studio's fine. They're sleeping <laughs> good at night. That There's a reason that they do that. There's a reason that Guy Ritchie sells his soul because the, the Statham will continue to get these. I'm also bothered by the fact that every goddamn action star in America is over 50 years old. Like, it's stupid. Are you just going to leave it there? What's wrong with being over 50 in an action yeah. star? Is that too old? I mean, come on. Liam Neeson running around there? What, 10 years from now, we're going to have taken with a walker and a dialysis machine? Come on, knock it off. Dan, America has daddy issues. That's all that is. <laughs> you guys are unbelievable. Liam Neeson will continue to get watched and paid for and viewers to pay their money because they like seeing him in that role because he can still do it. Were he to be in a walker, it wouldn't work anymore. Little tennis balls at the end of the walker. He's going to kill people <laughs> with the little tennis balls at the end of the walker. Again, cinephobe with Amin Al Hassan. John Travolta month is coming up. Valerie Lebitard, very excited about that. Also, David Sampson's Nothing Personal. You can get a lot of unfiltered, the good stuff, the sweet stuff over there. Thank you, guys. Appreciate, as always, the expertise. Excellent. Guys, thank no you for problem. making yourself available. You made it very easy for us to have a show today. This is the Dan Lebatar Show with the Stugatz Podcast. We usually do this with Ron McGill on Tuesdays, but today we are doing it on a special Wednesday edition, asking the animal questions. We've got a lot of them today, but one of them that came up the other day when we were talking about a hot air balloon that caught fire over the African plains and then landed in the African plains during my engagement trip to Africa. How much danger was I actually in, Ron? Not with the part of the balloon crashing, but just animals in the wild in Africa. What kind of danger was I landing in when the basket fell over sideways? And less danger that you have uh, walking across the street on Ocean Drive. Let's put it that way. Okay, the bottom line is this. Those animals, if that balloon came down, would all run away. Lions would run away. If you noticed, if you were flying over animals as you fly over them, they're running away. They're not used to something that large, that big. When it comes down, they're not going to come after you, Dan. You were never really in any danger. Me? Other than Are you talking about danger. me there or the balloon? That large, that big. You're talking about the balloon there, not me. <laughs> well, yes, the initial large largeness would be uh, the balloon. Ron, are wild animals aware of things like hot air balloons and planes and stuff like that that fly overhead? They're definitely aware of them, uh, and they become desensitized to them after a while. I mean, I know that still when you go in the plains, you know, I've been on balloon rides over the African plains many times, and I've not seen an animal that really is totally desensitized to it. They always look up, they always react, herds will run the other way. But yes, I mean, you can see Listen, you can get an animal desensitized to almost anything. You can go to Bush Gardens and you'll see a roller coaster going loop to loop right next to the giraffe exhibit. And giraffe don't even look at it. It's a flipping roller coaster. Just wah, 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 and the giraffe just eating their food so they don't pay attention because they become desensitized. So, yes, animals do become desensitized to things. Ron, how does the zoo handle mating? Is there a set schedule and what's the process that goes into that? Thank you. Baby. How, how do we handle mating? mating? We don't handle it all. We let them handle it amongst themselves. They do it spontaneously. Uh, the more they do it, uh, we assume that the uh, more content they are. Uh, we definitely, we you know, we put males and females together as to their genetic background. So we want to make sure we get the healthiest baby. We don't let just anybody screw. I mean, that's, that's not the right thing to do. We want to make sure that we're having the right animals pair up together to produce the healthiest offspring with the with the, with the best genetic pool behind them. Right. That's why I was asking, do you bring in animals from maybe other zoos uh, for 
the right genetic matching. That's that's yeah, absolutely. We're part of a program called the SSP, the Species Survival Plan. And basically, to put it in very simplistic terms, it's like computer data. Uh, just like people who breed dogs, you know, you have a pedigree, and your pedigree tells you which dog is the best dog to breed with which dog. Zoos have the same thing. There's one person for each species under the SSP. That person is called the stud bookkeeper. And that stud bookkeeper basically makes the decision as to which male should be with which female. Sometimes we'll fly a male of ours to be with a female, let's say, at the Los Angeles Zoo. Sometimes if it's not practical to fly the animal, we'll actually collect the sperm and use it to artificially inseminate that animal. So you're still, you know, producing the same genetic makeup without the threat and danger of having to ship an animal back and forth. Jessica, what do you have for Ron McGill? Ron, I read that NASA is sending squids into space. Um, and I'm curious, what exactly are researchers looking at when they send living organisms into space? And what might the squids look like when they return later this July? <laughs> That's a great question. I really don't know what they look like when they return. Uh, I think they're just looking at all kinds of things, whether it be, you know, the composition of their musculature, uh, their blood counts, um, if there's any elevation, let's say white blood counts, red blood counts, you know, what kind of reaction the body is going through. I'm sure they have a series of tests done by scientists who are much smarter than I am to see what the differences are as opposed to a gravity, uh, you know, based environment, because I'm sure that makes a difference as it does with human beings. Jessica, what's the story I heard you guys talking about with the elephants before we started here? What was happening with elephants that lost their way? Yeah, I don't know, Ron, if you read about this, but there was a group of elephants in China that wandered off course and ended up 300 miles away from their home. And I'm wondering um, what that means, just lost elephants. What happens when the elephants are lost? Well, you know, there's so much development. There's so much uh, human intrusion in so many areas. It's not that elephants may be lost. It just maybe they're looking for some place to better survive. Elephants are incredibly intelligent animals and they may be just searching for a better source of food, a better source of water as areas dry up, as their droughts, as their floods, whatever is affecting the environment. Elephants are very intelligent and will seek out uh, better ways to survive. You know, it's just like, you know, I, I don't like always to equate people with animals, but you know, sometimes if things are going bad and where you live, people migrate. They try to find a better place, a better living for their family. It must make you mad when people are hunting elephants, no? Yeah, it does make me mad, Dan. Uh, you know, uh, I wish people had the opportunity, as I've had, to see elephants in the wild, to look at an elephant face to face. When you look in the eyes of these animals, um, again, at the risk of sounding too overly, you know, bunny hugger, but there's a soul there. And uh, when you see an animal frightened or you see an animal scared, you can see it in their eyes. I've seen it in elephant eyes. Um, it's such a tragic thing. And to see how strong family bonds are with elephants, especially, I mean, you know, you've heard that term, it takes a village to raise a child. Elephants define that because that's what elephants do. They're matriarchal. The elephant females raise all the calves in the herd. They're so protective. They will literally lay their lives down for their calves. So it's, it's pretty distressing to think someone goes out there and hunts it for sport. Tony, what do you have for McGill? Ron, you're an extremely well-traveled man. We were having an, uh, not an argument, but a conversation about what the most interesting and weird thing we've eaten. What's the weirdest thing you've eaten on your travels? Um, it would be a big maggot. It looks like a huge white maggot that's found in the heart of a, of a tree uh, in South America. And it was just horrible because I had to eat it alive. You put it in your mouth, you bite down, it squirts like a massive zit into your mouth. And it's, um, it wasn't very tasty to say the least, but um, I always bring ketchups, uh, packets of ketchup with me when I travel to those places so I can try to make it more palatable. And that's what I use. I put the ketchup on it and then made it a little easier. You were being polite to some indigenous people, correct? Yes. Yes. Indigenous people. And, you know, that probably that maggot is probably healthier for me than health, half of the food I buy out of a grocery store here. Uh, it's just, you know, mentally it plays minds on you. First of all, something moving in your mouth, it's, it plays mind games with you and then just the the palatability you know, it's just like the soft gushy things that squirt in your mouth that's not like a nice sweet taste it's more like a salty tangy taste and the thing is still moving it's, it's not it's not pleasant mentally it's it's rough on the mind was it like a savory gusher no no it wasn't at all jessica like a savory gusher it was like eating a big ugly zit Oh, well, I would try a savory gusher, but I'm not sure about a big ugly Why zit. would you assume that a maggot of some sort, a giant maggot, would be a savory gusher? Did you not listen to anything well, he said before that? He's describing something as squishy, though. Like it, He it, said it, squishy, salty, like squirty, like yeah. mushy. I don't know. Sounded like it. 
Gushers. There's nothing good about it. And the fact that it continues to move, even once you bite into it and it squirts in your mouth, is just disgusting. Did you think about popping the maggot before putting it in your mouth? Mm. No, 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 no. That's that's the nutrition. You're supposed to get the nutrition. That's pops in your mouth. It's like a, a gel cap, so to speak, with all the medicine inside. Did like you politely gusher. decline a couple of times or did uh, you try I, and I extract never, yourself from the situation? I never do that, Dan. I never decline um, eating whatever I'm offered because it's just etiquette with indigenous people. You respect their their beliefs, you respect their feeding, and they're doing it out of the goodness of their heart. They're trying to, you know, it's, it's a privilege to be welcomed into their kind of circle that way. What's the most interesting ritual you've been a part of? Well, the most ritual, interesting ritual that I have seen, I've not been a part of it, thank God, is when the young boys in the Amazon, uh, they go through this bridge to manhood. They're made to put on these gloves made out of palm fronds where they've got bullet ants attached to the gloves. So when they put it on, these bullet ants are biting their hands and they're supposed to just kind of stay there without crying and screaming. I got hit by one bullet ant once in my life and it called a bullet ant for a reason because it feels like you got shot. And I'm looking at these kids that are probably 12, 13, 14 years old holding there. You see the tears welling up in their eyes. You see the perspiration. You know the pain they're feeling. It's horrific. But that was just something I, I watched with just horror. It was horror. Ron, after you had the maggot, did you eat something afterwards or were you like prolonged period without eating something? No, no. Lots of ketchup packets. Ketchup that, that's all you had, though? You didn't have another meal after that to like fill yeah, yourself they had, up? They had a type of like a manioc. It's like a, a, you know, it's like a potato that I was able to kind of eat with that. And it's kind of making it into a porridge that made it a little more palatable. Ron, the Great Barrier Reef is going to be uh, downgraded by the World Heritage uh, status. Um, what, what do you make of, and it's due to climate change, Australia plans to fight it. Uh, I, I presume all kinds of barrier reefs are, are, are suffering as a result. What, 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 do you, what do you make of that? Uh, I don't like the fact that they're downgrading it because it's taking, a te- if anything, it needs to be upgraded in its critical status right now. This is one of the great wonders of the world. Um, so much of it has already died off. It continues to die off. And people have to understand that rainforests, I mean, reefs are the rainforests of the ocean. Um, there is more life on these coral reefs than anyone can imagine. And as these reefs are dying, the oceans are slowly dying. And when people realize the amount of food, the amount of things that we get from the ocean for our own survival, uh, it needs to be a huge red flag. So I would be, uh, I don't like the term downgrading. I'd be upgrading all of that into such a critical status that people need to pay attention because at the end of the day, it's going to affect our own quality of life. What does that mean that it's being downgraded just for people who don't know? I think what they're saying is they're downgrading it from one of the great natural wonders of the world because it's no longer one of the great natural wonders of the world because it's lost so much of it to the death of its coral life. Um, so, you know, it should be upgraded as to one of the big things that we need to be paying attention to and trying to protect. Jessica, here's your opening. It's just the good barrier reef now. Eh? <laughs> eh? Eh? Oh! What? Uh, McGill, the Amazon you mentioned, can you tell us what you have in terms of personal knowledge with the Kanduru fish? <laughs> okay, that's a myth, Dan. First of all, this thing, I, the Kanduru fish is a fish that supposedly swims up the urethra of a penis if you're urinating in the water. OK, and has a dorsal fin spine that once it gets locked up in there, locks up into the urethra and it can't come out. And you have to have surgery to split your penis open to take the condura out. OK, this is a grossly exaggerated thing. I don't know if there's there have been some papers written about it, but there's never been like a documented photographed procedure where this has happened. Yes, there are certain uh, parasites that will try to swim up a warm fluids. So if you're urinating in the water, you create this warm fluid that might draw something to try to swim up in there. But it's been blown out of proportion with this spine coming out of the back of its back that locks up in the urethra. And now you have like a kidney stone in your freaking urethra with a spine of a fish that's wiggling and you have the surgery. And then you start thinking, oh, my God, now my penis is going to fall off. It's never going to work again. I got to get this gross thing to swam up there. That's very much exaggerated, Dan. What are the greatest dangers of the Amazon? Um, geez, just things like, uh, 
you know, mosquito-borne diseases, blood-borne diseases. That's the most dangerous thing in the Amazon. Some of the, uh, you know, venomous plants, venomous snakes, of course. It's not jaguars. It's not anacondas. It's not piranhas. That's all BS. It's been blown out of proportion. The, 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 the most dangerous things are the things you don't see as much. Uh, the diseases that can spread through, uh, again, through m- mosquito-borne diseases, things like that. It's not the animals. So many people think, oh, my God, I'm going to get killed by a jaguar. I'm going to get swallowed by an anaconda. I'm going to get attacked by a harpy eagle. Not true. Skeptical Billy is. I disagree. I disagree. No No offense. Billy, I went down to the Amazon. I did a documentary and I brought Christy Kruger, one of our local anchors with me down there. And we went in the Amazon and we were fishing for piranha. As soon as I put the the line in the water, man, I'm pulling piranha left and right. I mean, piranha, fight it. Lots of piranha. As fast as we put the line in the water. And then when the camera was rolling, I freaked her out. I jumped off the boat into the water. They all Mm -hmm. thought I was going to get eaten. And I joked, oh! And I looked at them and said, nothing's happening, guys. That's all a myth. That movie you see with a cow going down the river and then the next scene is just the bones of floating down the river. Mm -hmm. That's a bunch of movie bs i don't know ron i've never heard of mosquito 3d but i've seen piranha 3d oh my god what a bunch of bs that is i've gone swimming and christy jumped in afterwards i made her jump in oh she didn't christy did not she did christy went and she will vouch for me that she jumped in where all those piranhas were and didn't get one single bite so stop it stop proliferating that myth ron can't you just put on like a bunch of deet and just go in the amazon with some deet yeah, absolutely. If you're going into the Amazon with a bunch of deep, that's going to help you out. But you asked me what the most dangerous thing was. Dangerous. What did he say? Yeet? Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> that is Billy Gill in the chat with Yeet. We will let you go on that note. Thank you, Ron, for making an appearance. I don't think that he knew that you could see the chat. He thinks you're a. Uh, he likes to bother you, and and no, he, he's you don't like Dan. Him. Dan, let me ask you a question. If I give you the option, jump in a tank full of piranha, or walk through this, you know, outdoor area with mosquitoes, which you're going to choose. Uh, that is correct, but he is more knowledgeable, and he's actually done it. And you're calling him a liar. Thank you, thank you, Dan. Thank you, Dan. And yeet to you, Billy. You all have a wonderful week. This guy's been doing a lot of good work for a long time for Sports Illustrated and with his books. He's got a new one out, Glory Days, the Summer of 1984, and the 90 Days That Change Sports and Culture Forever. So tell us about those 90 days, why it is you decided to write about those 90 days. You choose subject matter when you're writing a book that you're going to invest years of your life in. So why did you choose these 90 days? This originally started as a, as a Sports Illustrated story on Michael Jordan and the 1984 Olympic trials that took place in my hometown in, uh, in Bloomington, Indiana. And I, I didn't think you could quite do an entire book on uh, the 84 Olympic basketball team, and it would have been too derivative of McCallum's book on the Dream Team. But the more I poked around, I was like, you know, an Im- incredible amount of really significant, memorable, prominent for, for, for decades sports events took place that summer. And struck me that uh, J- Jordan was a pretty good metaphor, who people forget started that summer reluctant to even go pro. He wanted to go back to UNC. Dean Smith essentially made him go to the NBA. Uh, he's sort of the, the schlubby college kid, and by the end of the summer, he has a gold medal. He's a lottery pick. He has his own signature shoe deal, and uh, in, in the span of a few months, he was completely transformed, and the little the, the device of the book is this was a bigger, the sort of mirrored sports more generally, and uh, you could say the same thing about sports. It started the summer in one place and ended somewhere very different. What else was in the story? Michael Jordan is the catapult, right? Because we turn him through the mythologizing of commercialization, of him sitting out a lot of conversations. We turned him into somebody who was just sports hero excellence personified. And are you talking about Spike Lee and where the commercialization of Michael Jordan began? What was happening in those specific 90 days to Jordan? First of all, the, the word was out of just how good he was. I mean, B- Bob Knight was saying on record, you know, Michael Jordan is the best basketball player on the planet right now. I don't mean potentially. I don't mean down the road when he can compete with, with Magic and Larry Bird right now. And that was before he played his first NBA game. Meanwhile, David Falk is saying, you know what? enough of signing these guys to a shoe deal and throwing them on a poster and giving them a couple of shekels to wear their converse. We're going to really turn this guy into 
a brand. And that hadn't really been done in, in team sports before. And then, you know, that that same summer, as Jordan was, again, before he's played the first game for the Chicago Bulls, it is completely sort of re- reforming himself and uh, reinventing himself. While that's happening, Bird and Magic are playing in game seven of the NBA Finals for the first time. Wayne Gretzky wins his first Stanley Cup. The NBA has a new commissioner, this guy, David Stern, who one, one of his big goals is to see if the NBA could transcend borders and actually move beyond the U.S. Um, the you know, ESPN was sold to ABC. You had the Supreme Court case that said, you know what, maybe college football teams can negotiate their own football contracts. And that sort of uh, is at the heart of the, the legislation and the cases that's going on now. You had a profitable Olympics. You had this this guy, Vince McMahon, say, you know what, I'm going to get all these territories of wrestling and I'm going to streamline them into one organization and we're going to hold one event that crosses over and uses cable TV. And that ended up being the birth of WrestleMania. Um, all this was happening sort of week by week by week. Um, same in pop culture. You know, Purple Rain comes out one week and Ghostbusters comes out the next week and Born in the USA comes out the week after that. And it did. I, th- I think you and I are about the same age. I mean, I, you know, I was in, I guess, sixth, seventh grade and it seemed like a pretty cool summer and you liked Karate Kid and everybody loved the Olympics and you ate free Big Macs when Americans won gold, but it didn't seem like this transformative summer. It didn't seem, you know, it wasn't like the, the summer of 68 is described, but you look back and you just say, holy cow, so much was crammed into this event that still has resonance, whatever, 37 years later. What you're really talking about here, though, is sort of pinpointing a three-month period where sports became what we know it to now be as business, right? You're saying ESPN media giant. You're saying college football becoming television programming. You're mm-hmm. saying, you're identifying the things that made sports giant business the next four decades afterward. Absolutely. I mean, that's exactly right. And I started out with, oh, there's a series of coincidences. And then it was sort of like, okay, well, what, is it just coincidences? Is it just this amazing concentration of events that we all remember? Or is there something else? And I, I think the big something else were, Cable TV, I and mean, this was really the summer of cable, and MTV started turning a profit, and CNN started turning a profit, and ESPN was sold and, and sort of very cleverly said, you know what, instead of paying these cable systems to be on their, their options of channels, you know what, they should be paying us. Who wants to get cable if you can't get ESPN? We're going to charge them a subscriber fee, which seemed radical at the time, but was the, the secret sauce that led ESPN to be what it is. And guys like David Stern and Vince McMahon and Peter Ubroth, they saw that coming. They saw what cable was going to do to sports. And you also had, I mean, again, I I think he's real. I mean, one thing I took away from this book, David Falk has probably gotten a a short shrift by history because what he did with Jordan and the way he approached it and the way he negotiated with Nike and the way he said, you know, the Bulls can pay Michael Jordan whatever they're going to pay him, but he ought to be making 10 times that when he's not playing basketball. It, It sounds crazy now, but that really hadn't been done. I mean, it, it used to be, uh, you know, again, hey, hey, Magic, wear these Converse shoes and uh, we may spend a day of your summer shooting a commercial. What David Falk did for Jordan was completely transformative. And um, and here it's exactly what you said. I mean, here, here we are. And uh, these are the origins of, of modern sports as we know it. It was almost quaint once upon a time that the Lakers would bestow upon Magic Johnson a 25-year, $25 million contract. (laughs) It was all the money in the world. Was Michael Jordan more important to Nike, or was Nike more important to Michael Jordan? That is a great question. That that is a book in itself right there. Um, Michael Jordan rookie contract, by the way, I think it was $565,000. But no, I mean, you you look at where uh, they they were obviously the – the easy answer is they, they were great together and they did right by each other. I mean, look at what the Jordan brand is worth today. Look at what Jordan did for Nike in, in the mid to late 80s, not just in terms of sales, but they had the global athlete. I mean, they, they had the man in sports. And look how they wrote that. Look at Nike's revenues from the summer of 84 when they signed Jordan. They do this whole presentation. They get a designer who's flying back from D.C. where Jordan's agent was and he sees a kid next to him on the plane with a pair of wings and decides to make an Air Jordan logo with those wings. Look at what happens to Nike from, say, summer of 84, fall of 84, when Jordan finally starts playing and it's as good as advertised for the Bulls, and project that out for 10 years. And um, whatever Jordan was getting from Nike probably was, was a fraction of what he earned that company. 
Nike and ESPN combined, correct? The explosion of both of those things. Sneaker com- uh, company commercialization, monetization combined with media giant becoming sports empire and needing to fill the mill. What else was contributing in the time of MTV toward Michael Jordan? It, it's a unique, it's a big bang, correct? Yep, exactly. And I think, you know, with that, but when you saw how much money Michael Jordan could make and how he could structure a deal, I mean, Michael Jordan had a bonus clause where if the Bulls, who before he got to the team were drawing less than 50% capacity, he got an attendance bonus clause. I think a lot of athletes woke up not just to ways you could cleverly frame a contract, which, you know, not every athlete has, has the leverage or the pull of Michael Jordan to do that. But I, I think there was this awakening, not in terms of political activism and platform that we usually talk about with athletes, but economics and power. I mean, Michael Jordan, this is one of my favorite stories. Michael Jordan did not go to the 84 draft, right? You have this new commissioner. He's got this thick mustache. He's riding this hot hand. This guy, David Stern, he's just sat courtside as the Lakers beat the Celtics. Game seven, first time Bird and Magic playing a final. So David Stern, he's he's on a hot streak. And he says, you know what? In a few days from now, we got this draft coming up. We're going to make it a thing. The draft used to just be a bunch of guys in a hotel ballroom. We're going to televise this. We're going to pay the USA Network, one of these new cable outfits, to broadcast it. We want all the players to come. And Michael Jordan didn't go to the draft that year. Why was that? Because Bob Knight, the Olympic coach, wouldn't let him leave Indiana and spend a day in Manhattan. You know, Knight said, I don't want him to get his ass kissed by, by uh, a bunch of suits in New York. So Michael Jordan is the third pick in the draft that year, and he celebrates by going out for a Big Mac with George Raveling at a McDonald's in Bloomington, Indiana. I mean, that's how he spent draft night. And I think, you know, you hear that story, and it's kind of quaint, and I have a bunch of stories that are, that are personal in the book, how we used to go watch this team practice, and they, did, they didn't even lock the doors of the gym. I mean, anyone off the street could have walked in and watched Jordan Barkley viewing Chris Mullen and John Stockton practice that summer. It just wasn't a thing. And it's, it's quaint and it's sort of, uh, you know, it's, it's nostalgia. But I think what it also says is these athletes had zero power and these athletes didn't recognize their worth. They didn't recognize their financial worth. And I think one thing that we sort of gloss over in the, in the Jordan Nike signature shoe retelling is the immense amount of power that that swung back to the athletes. I mean, the fact that Jordan was making 10, 20 times as much from Nike and from bonuses as he was from what, you know, Rod Rod Thorne and the Bulls were paying him, I I think it's something we don't talk about enough because it really, I think, is this big demarcation point in athletes and agents realizing what labor is worth. The name of the book is Glory Days, the Summer of 84 and the 90 Days that Change Sports and Culture Forever. He also is an executive editor and senior writer at Sports Illustrated and just wanted so people don't actually have to go and read the things that you have reported and given expertise on. I'd like some Cliff Notes versions on some of the things you've written recently. So why are influencers taking over boxing here? How is this happening? And is it a good thing that this is happening? The, uh, the, the the jury is out on that. This was this was pre Mayweather fight. I'll have you know, but um, I I am I mean, but yo, know, I'm one of these people. I don't know if you're the same way. I'm I'm a hundred percent in. You know, I'll I'll pay any PPV for for MMA. I mean, I'll I'll watch every USC card. Boxing has completely lost me, and I think a lot of people are in that same boat. And this is uh this is sort of a shot shot in the arm for boxing to have these influencers fight. And most people can't name the heavyweight champ, but they know the Paul brothers. And so this sort of is an examination of that. And is this going to save boxing or is this going to completely distort this sport into anyone with a social media following that can lace up gloves, uh, can get a fight. Is this why you were lured to the story of the MMA fighter who punched back the story you wrote about police killing George Floyd? What was, what was the starting point on that story? It's funny. I, I did a book like 10 years ago. I, I got assigned to do this story for Sports Illustrated. I knew nothing. I mean, I didn't know if it was live or fake or real. I mean, I knew nothing about MMA and did a story about 10 years ago for Sports Illustrated and got completely hooked and ended up doing a, a book on MMA. And I spent time at a gym in the Quad Cities. And one of the uh, one of the managers there tipped me off that one of the George Floyd witnesses was an MMA fighter who wasn't you know, he wasn't a UFC level level fighter, but he was taking pro fights and he was sort of fighting in and around the Midwest. And then I sort of followed it a little bit. And then I watched him testify. And it was, I don't know if you remember, I mean, it was really powerful stuff. And he was this 
MMA fighter who said, look, I'm, I'm standing there. I understand what these chokes are all about. I understand how inappropriate this is. I'm also a guy with, you know, I've, I've got a girlfriend. I've got kids. I can't just jump in. And he was paralyzed. And he spoke at the trial really movingly about that. He understood completely what this choke was, how inappropriate it was. And yet he felt frozen. And um, when, when I saw him testify, I was like, I got to get in touch with this guy and tell the story. And he was really, I, I thought, really poignant telling that he, when he prepared for this trial, he looked at it as if he were preparing for a fight. And he stood in front of the mirror and he thought about potential pitfalls and he strategized and he even sort of did push-ups and sit-ups to work off his nervous energy. And he ended up giving some of the most compelling testimony, I thought, at that George Floyd trial. And now he's trying to figure out, is he ready to channel that back into fighting and go back to trying to be an MMA fighter? Or is he so horrified by seeing a choke misused? And uh, is he sort of so damaged by what he saw that he's now turning against violence? And he's, he's kind of wrestling with that right now. You've written a lot about tennis over the years. What made you explore recently the parent as coach dynamic? Because it's something that's been present the entire time you've been interested in tennis. Um, yeah, I mean, you really only have this in individual sports, right? I mean, the notion of an NBA parent being intimately involved with the career of a 22-year-old is, is silly. And yet in, in tennis, you have that. And some of it's financial, right? You can save. You don't have to pay a coach when dad is sitting there. And in some cases, the, the Williams sisters being the most obvious, it actually is really successful. And these parents know what buttons to push and they know how to motivate their kid and they can say things that a coach can't. Um, in other cases, it's disastrous. And uh, in, in a recent case, you know, a female in South Florida, Pembroke Pines, Sonia Kennan, a young American who actually won the uh, Australian Open last year, she recently parted ways with her father. And it was one of these cases where uh, – you know, it, it probably wasn't a healthy relationship and it took a lot of courage for her to push dad out and say, uh, you know, t time for me to fly solo here. That world is so parental, all of it, culturally. Mm -hmm. It's not just coaches. It's just the whole thing. The thing the thing that happened with Osaka felt parental to me, as if the lording body it gets to be your father and your mother because and and the kids tend to be I don't know, used to it, I guess I would say, used to seeing, used to being parented. It doesn't seem like they're as grown up so, in some ways as the other athletes because of the coddling of the ecosystem. Am I wrong about this? You know it more than I do. No, you, you are 100% right. And you have these dueling forces where it's really stressful and it's an individual sport and it's, it's real combat and it requires mental toughness. And yet, Everyone's kind of their own company. There's no, you know, there's no union. I mean, there's no one running ship. It's, it's a very strange relationship with a coach where, you know, they're the coach. They're in theory telling you what to do, but you're paying them, right? I mean, it, it's as if Steph Curry were paying Steve Kerr. I mean, it's, it's a strange dynamic with an outside coach and there's a distrust, you know, the other player on the other side of the net. Yeah, it's a colleague, but they're also trying to beat you. And you're traveling all over the world, so you have that. You're away. You know, if you don't go, not, not like your parents can just pop over and go to the game or, or watch you. Uh, you know, Del Curry can fly to uh, fly to the Bay Area and, and keep getting an Airbnb for a while. You can't do that when your kid's going from from Tokyo to Shanghai to Dubai. And so you put it all together, and you have these very strange relationships. And you're you're right. There is a real sort of mix of, of fierce independence. So Naomi Osaka releases that she didn't confer with anyone she didn't have to run that by pr i mean there's there's she completely free to do that on her own but then once she did there was this you're right there was this really parental paternalistic response where all these bodies sort of cracked down on her so it's it's the dynamic i tell you it makes for it's one reason i love the sport i mean it's great to cover i mean it makes for uh it makes for good storytelling but it, it, it's a really fraught environment for a lot of reasons but yeah what you just hit on is absolutely correct it's it's a sort of weird mix of Fierce independence. I can play whenever I want. And if I want to quit a tournament, I quit a tournament. But you combine that with the fact that between the, the tours and the tournaments and the coaches and the parents, the players have, have all the power in the world and they have very little power. John, appreciate the time, sir. Thank you for the work you do. You got it. Congrats. I feel like uh, I'm seeing your new home and uh, it's it's you. The risk of uh, dry, you, you are a role model. It's, uh, it's great what you've done. Seriously. Oh, thank you. That's very kind of you.
This is the Dan Levator Show with the Stugats Podcast. What do you think uh, is normally on that wall behind Scotty Pippen? Because he had lots of bottles of bourbon. Other bottles. <laughs> of yeah, I feel like, like it's just like a converted liquor cabinet. Wait, Billy, you think that was, was he in his house there? I don't know. I, I mean, I got maybe no. he took down like family photos or books and it's like, let's I, put all the bourbon on the wall. I think that was set up for, I think it was probably at their, right? Corporate uh, office. Yeah. Yes. There was like some marketing office or something mm. there where they set up like, I think, I don't know. Do you think those are all full bottles of bourbon or like, you, you ever seen the thing where uh, they, they like in commercials? <laughs> yeah, no, like they, like I think in, um in, uh, commercials like where they like they try and show a pancake with syrup they put like motor oil on it or something like that to oh, make yeah. it to make yeah. it look like more glossy like they, they do things in commercials all the time I've to make something that. look like it, 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 it yeah. something oh, that yeah. it's not and pizza commercials Food they stylists. use glue to actually like separate the pizza it's like glue strands to make it look white and cheesy really mm-hmm. so they glue together pieces of pizza and when you pull them apart that's what makes it look like. Look at this pizza ripping apart. I so, so cheesy. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> mm. I think it'd have a pancake with motor oil, based on a, like look alone. Right. Oh, okay. Huh. You meaning it would pass? You're saying like if motor oil was on your pancake, unbeknownst to you, you would probably still eat it, right? Yeah. Yeah, I think I'm okay. with you. Right. right. Yeah. So in this scenario, you're eating a pancake with motor oil by mistake. Mm. I'm just saying, like, I would think it's syrup. Yeah, right, That's exactly. All. Right. Yeah. I would take a bite, realize it's motor oil, and probably stop <laughs> eating it. <laughs> well, I don't know, though, because if, if I, okay, let's say I'm looking, right? And it's like, choose one or two, like you're at the eye doctor, and one is the motor oil, and one is the syrup. Obviously, they're doing it with the motor oil because it looks more appetizing, right? So why not give it a whirl? Maybe see if it tastes as good as it looks. You never know. So this mm-hmm. is back to our earlier conversation about judging foods based off appearance. We're like, I think if it said motor oil underneath, I still might just based on the way <laughs> that it's presented. This makes absolutely no sense. No, he's I got to said- be honest with you. It's one of those situations where I just started talking without an actual plan <laughs> right, where we right, were going with right, it. And right. it seemed like things were slowing down a bit. Uh-huh. So I'm like, ah, let's uh, just see if yeah. there's any more of this motor oil pancake. Everyone, yeah. everyone in the Zoom it. has a tell. For when they're uncomfortable that a conversation has stopped oh, going. Oh wow! Yours is hmm. Chris always does the uh, well, great parade or any well. Like there's no one I know who's more uncomfortable with a beat of silence than Chris Cody. <laughs> yeah, but everyone's got to tell. What, and he fills it. Chris is, Cody will fill it. He does. Uh, what does Roy's tell? I don't think he has one. That's a good point. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Poker face. Over here. I don't think I have one either. You do, like you, a, you do like a lean off to the side a little bit. Wow. Look at this guy studying all of us. Yeah. I probably get quieter. Why do we all hate silence? Silence is okay. Because it's radio. I don't. It's not air. radio. It's no, not, we're, not we're no longer on just, the radio. No, I'm saying I think that's general. where you arrived at a great place in a relationship where the silence is comfortable. You should be comfortable. We should all be comfortable with silence. Yeah. We're not on the radio. Yeah, but we've been doing radio for so long that we're kind of used to filling in silences. Right, you know, that lasts for more than three seconds. So, Stu guys, when you're at home with your wife, you don't mind there being silence. Awesome. You don't. You don't. What think- do that crave silence? <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. What? what do you think the proper number of people present in a silent moment is before it turns uncomfortable? Like, do you think I, it's more uncomfortable between two people, or if there's eight people and there's silence? I think we should test this out. I think we should do a full minute right now on air. No one talks. But we have to look at each other. We all have to be unmuted. I feel like that's and look easy at each though, other. Right? It's harder See when it's breaks people first. in the same A full place. minute. All right, ready? I'm going to time so, well, no. Okay. Just, uh, just so we're clear here, a full minute, we're staring at each other. Yes, but unmuted, everybody. No Chris one's allowed Cody. to talk. Right. Not even a full minute. Let's... Let's see how long we can go, guys. All right. Let's all okay, just ready? look at each other and see who breaks. Chris, are you paying attention? Five. I'll be looking four. at Tony. <laughs> look at the Zooms, you guys. You'll see all of us. Oh. All right.
All right, who has the birds chirping? Who's chirping? <laughs> Whose birds are chirping? This is Whittingham. We didn't even make it a full minute. That was 42 seconds, it and those are my like, birds, it by it the way. It felt like forever. That was really I mean, yeah, that was, you have pet birds, or those are birds bad. outside? I wanted to make a joke so many times. Like, it needed a joke, that, was, like, that silence. It just what, needed something. Oh, what were you God. thinking? I don't just know. Like, <laughs> let's explore what was going through your head. <laughs> <laughs> I think I was just going to say, like, good parade or something. <laughs> right. That's really all I have in those moments. Uh, <laughs> One in the chamber. Rated. We have to put that in the podcast and see how many people message us and say that something was wrong with the audio for 40 <laughs> seconds. I mean, yeah. you get hear really the background mad. noise in your neighborhood. I, the, the podcast app that I use trims silences. I wonder if it just like will go from one bit of it to the next without like, what podcast like, app fancy is app it's an app yeah. called overcast right and uh, it, it has, trims silences it, it has several speed settings one of them is called smart speed right. it basically gets rid of all the silences so like if there's like a three second bit of oh, it's just, and you're out you're, you're, you're on to the next yeah but silences are a big part of you need a little mm-hmm. pause yeah, in radio pause. some silence yeah. 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 what's the matter with I mean, you they're, like, they're silence so, is so golden. actually right. so I, I turn it off when I listen right. to this show or when I listen to this show as a listener um, so I turned off that setting you can customize it per podcast so I would do that but like for the most part when you're trying to like get information from a podcast first off i have moved to one and a half times speed so I, i'm i'm there now and i'm on smart speed as well so i'm kind of like i'm mowing through like a 40 minute podcast in like 28 minutes or something like that and uh it's a more efficient experience 1.5 is a good speed though i love 1.5 yeah i'm a 1.2 person yeah I'm I'm I'm, matric- I'm matriculating my way up. I think I can get to two at some point. Wait, but I have a question. One point five. It's not fast enough. Like it doesn't dilute the product at all. No. Uh, again, so like if if the show is an entertainment experience, I won't do it. Like if you're if you're trying, but like if it's like an information based thing, or it's like you know like the New York Times Daily. I'm just trying to get the news. Like you know, I I'll, I'll listen to it. It doesn't dilute it for me. And also, like this app allows you to do it incrementally. So I was at like one point one two, one point two five, one point three, and now I'm at one point five. So I've kind of like my ears have slowly adjusted. I actually did listen to this show for a period at speed, and for a while when I would listen to you talk at normal speed, it sounded like you were slurring and drunk. Like and you, you talking normally, I was so used to hearing it in my ears at speed that I thought you were like. Like you, like your speech had slowed. Chris, it sounds like you're going at 1.5 yeah. speed right now. Yeah, you're, you're really Slow hauling ass down. right now. Yeah. Jesus Christ! God, so I sounded drunk. Yeah, uh, you always sound drunk though. It's yeah, as oh, opposed thank, to now. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> I am drunk now. Uh, <laughs> Scotty Pippen's digits. Wherever you get alcohol. Well, not not wherever you get it. Yeah, it only seems to be only in places. Chicago. <laughs> Mariano's and Jewel was what I heard. Uh, Is I it available know. online? Probably, right? Go find Scotty Pippen's digits. Yeah, he's a lovely guest. Even though he, so to guys, when when he when he went back to you for the Durant thing, you, I was scared. You? Hey, Chris, how are you? I like the way you spell your name. Oh well, it's wrong. So. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm. Uh, I have this name despite being 100% Colombian, and we think along the way it was completely mangled by someone who doesn't know how to spell. That's hilarious. My yeah. name means black in Polish. Really? Yeah, isn't that funny? Yeah, Jessica, who's on our Zoom, her last name means sour cream in some Eastern European language. Shut up. Yeah. In in Czech, Russian, and Ukrainian, like all the Slavic mm. languages, probably Polish too. You're joking, right? No, no I'm serious. No, it's it's 100% like super, true. I hate it. It's super embarrassing. Like, oh, why? stop it. Are you kidding? It's like, it means sour cream. That's yeah. amazing. Yes. Yeah, that's amazing. I guess it's better than like mustard because that sounds weird too. But but you know what's cool about sour cream? Sour cream is the thing now that everybody uses if you want to be a little healthier as like a substitute and stuff that still tastes good. Do you know what I mean? So that's true. I think it's having a moment and that's, that's awesome. I hate to do this, and I don't. We just Julio Jones you. We're going to use all of that. You're live on the air, Lindsay Zarniak, with no warning. We may have committed a federal crime here, (laughs) but that is where we're beginning. So thank you for being on with us. And I don't know the history of your name, actually. And you came through. Yeah, your story came through Miami, but I don't know. I don't actually know your family story. Oh, first of all, thank you. No, it's great to see you, Dan. Um, I Well, so I was saying that Zarniak means black in Polish. And so like when we were, when I was growing up and we would have to wait, like my dad always tells a story when he would put our name in for a reservation or something. And he would sometimes put black because it took them forever to, you know, spell and figure out how to say Zarniak. So there's that. But no, my family story, I mean, 
my dad was a journalist, which is probably where I like he covered sports um, and he started at USA Today. He was doing horse racing and then NFL and and some other sports. And that's probably, I think, where I I caught that bug, like through osmosis. And um, they're in Virginia. And I still like I we love I love to talk to my dad about stuff still in the business, which is he's sort of a sounding board and film order yourself. Did they try to dissuade you from this as a career path just because of the degree of difficulty? No. Do you know what's funny is I, so I did the Olympics as a summer intern for USA Today in Atlanta. And I remember, like, I vividly remember being in the, the newsroom and one of the writers that my dad worked with, he was like, Lindsay, if you never want to grow up, this is what you want to do, do sports. And at that time, like, I didn't know that that's what I for sure wanted to do was, was news or reporting or whatever. But no, like he, my dad was always really like open and would always take me to events and he would always talk about what he did. But no, they didn't dissuade me. I mean, I think sometimes now they're like, what are you doing? Lindsay, when so, did you know? Honestly, it was when I was at James Madison University and we had a practicum. So we had this class where we had to take every single, we had to do every single role that it, we, it would require to produce a show. And it was there, honestly, because it was like, that was the first time that I chose that over the parties. You know, I was like, I just want to be like working on this project and when I had the role of host for whatever like couple days that was, I was I had a co-host and I was also obsessed with MTV. Like that, if someone had said, what did you want to do? I wanted to be Martha Quinn. Like I was, I was hooked. I loved the way that watching music videos made me feel. And I could only watch it at my grandparents' house because we didn't have cable. And there was just, I loved it. I was obsessed. I could watch it for hours. And so when I was doing that show at JMU, we were, we just had so much fun. And there was this like banter and interaction and I sucked. Like I was awful. And when I go back and watch those tapes that I have on VHS, it's like so embarrassing, but that was what lit it up for me. I was like, I need to do, like, if I could do this, if there was some version of this, this would not be work, you know? And so that, that's when the passion, I think really first, first kind of lit me up. But my path was weird. Like I started in news and then I had a random twist that led me to Miami. And that's, that's what it was. I was with some guys that worked at my news station in Jacksonville. They knew that I liked racing and they were like, you want to come with us to Daytona? You can just help us out, carry some equipment. And I was like, yeah, sure. So I went and we were waiting to interview the driver who won. And actually it was Greg Biffle. And um, I was waiting to interview him. And these guys from Miami struck up a conversation and they were from NBC. And we were just all waiting for the same interview. And before we left, they were like, hey, you know, you seem to know your stuff. We have an opening. The woman who was doing this job left to go to Washington and they were like, and we need a reporter and a host for this show we called Finns TV. And that's, that was it. And so I went to Miami, but it was a part-time gig. Like it was that for me at that time, it was such a risk. It was like such an exciting risk that I really wanted to take. But I remember I kind of had to, like, I, I talked to my dad a lot about it. There was like a lot of inner circle conversation. Cause I'm at the moment, I'm like, do I leave this news reporting job and take a part-time job in Miami where I'm covering the Miami Dolphins off the field. And to me, that sounded like a dream because it was like the storytelling that I loved. But in the guys at, um, at WTVJ, the NBC in Miami were like, we will coach you. We will help you with whatever you need, but you will be our third sportscaster. And like, uh, to be honest, like that, I was like, holy crap. Like, I like really, you know, cause that going from news reporting to that, it was really different, but it was such a great move. How rare were you as a woman with expertise in motorsports? How alone were you? Super alone. I mean, I could probably, like, at that time, I could have named the three other people that I knew that were women, but they were super, it was a great group. Like, they, we really, I think, helped each other or at least, like, could lean on each other. But when I started... I was also doing some work for the Speed Channel. And that was because I had met this group of like producers and folks that work for the Speed Channel when I was down on like a long weekend in outside Daytona. And I, I met them and we struck up a conversation anyway. So that was random. But yeah, it was wild. Like, and I remember the first time I walked into a garage and it was the ARCA series, which is like one of the grassroots series that feeds into NASCAR. And I was so intimidated because, as you know, it's like the garage, especially back then, it's all it's all men. They're all working on a car. I did not know a lot about race cars at all. And so I remember there was this one time I was I walked in. We all have this credential that's a hard card. So it's the same credential you use every weekend when you're covering racing. And I was so nervous. And I like 
got the cojones to walk up to this like engine, you know, this lead engine mechanic. And I'm like, Hey, you know, here, here I am like little blonde gal, you know, like, and I'm like, Hey, how's, so how's the chassis? Like, I don't even know what I was asking. And he's like, and he laughed at me and he looked down. He's like, Hey, nice picture on my credential. And I was like, Oh, thanks. And I looked down and someone had taken a Sharpie and drawn a mustache on my face, on my credential. And I had been walking around for like two days with a mustache. So anyway, so it was hard, but it was, you just, I had to ask a million questions, you know, and figure it out. And people for the most part were very helpful and, and I love it. I'm wondering when you talk about that fear of getting fired, if there was ever like a fear of breaking the unwritten rules of journalism as a young woman covering sports, because that's something that I was kind of met with head on working at Sports Illustrated. You get away with much less when you're a young, enthusiastic woman than I think young, enthusiastic men can get away with. Like, and when you mean that, yeah, tell me more, like, give me an example of that because I think we're exactly on the same page. It's true. Yeah. So I think if you're an enthusiastic, like young man working in sports, you're not really questioned. But when you're an enthusiastic young woman, it's like, well, does she like the athletes? Is she romantically interested in them? Is she too enthusiastic about them? Like, why does she like this so much? Women aren't supposed to like this. And then there's like this constant self-consciousness you have when you're covering certain events that, okay, maybe I need to like repress my feelings and my enthusiasm and, and be just stone cold, like straight, not showing any emotion because I don't want it to be misinterpreted by the older men in the room. Yeah, definitely. There are times too that I've had, I remember a moment in Miami where there were two quarterbacks who were like, they were playing a joke on me. And like one of them got me to turn around intentionally at the time where the other guy had his pants around his ankles. Right. And it was funny. And it was funny, obviously, like in that moment, you, that's a scenario where I'm like, okay, what, like, cause you don't want anyone to think that like you're engaged in that. Right. But I think that in terms of showing like too much enthusiasm, yeah, that's something that can cross your minds. But honestly, that's also like, it's also, I think just natural, like the difference in men and women when you're a journalist and being perceived, like sometimes I do feel like I will be perceived as you're pushy, right? Or you're pushy with an idea or you're pushy with a concept that you think, right? I would have never gotten that impression from looking at you that you had this fear roiling inside you. It was very, and was that roiling inside of you when you're at ESPN? When you're on, you're on, you've arrived at whatever the destination is, right? You come through Miami, you go, the degree of difficulty on what you're doing is pretty hard, right? It's not just a woman in sports, but uh, it's going through NASCAR and they might be, or it's going through racing. They might be Southern gentlemen, but they might be some cavemen too. So you're coming up and you get to ESPN and that at the time, it's not quite the golden age of ESPN, but it's still a destination. So it's still roiling within you there. Um. Well, and it wasn't like roiling. It's not like roiling, like it's something that always bothers me. It's just, you know what I mean? It's just like there. And I think it's also something that you use as fuel, right? That's, that's kind of what I mean by it. And I think, so what was weird is when I got to ESPN, I mean, I had people that were telling me not to do it and I really wanted to do it. Like I, um, just because I, w- I had people that were, I mean, I'm not afraid to say it. They were like, you'll be part of a hamster wheel. You'll be part of a, like that you're going to get there. You, it, it's a definite system that you've got to work yourself into. But I really, I was so pumped about the opportunity. And I, I had someone there who had said to me, Hey, just get here and we are going to figure out this spot for you. But we see you on sports center. We're excited about you being there. And I know that once you go through the system here, it's going to, it's going to end like in a really great way, whatever. That was the conversation I had that was like, I want to do this and I want to be there because I had the faith that it, it would work, right? But when I first got there, so I I walked away from, I left NBC4 in Washington. And when I was there, I mean, George Michael hired me. And and I feel like when I say that, I have to preface that it's like George Michael, the sportscaster. Well, and this, not is, this is the I greatest don't know, thing on her resume I don't, I don't is what it is. I don't know how old you were, but uh, this was a time where the only rival to ESPN <laughs> was this man's damn sports machine. Oh, it was great. This was true. This is, no, but this guy was as famous as any sportscaster yes. in America, and he had the weekly highlights, and he had a damn machine that I yeah. believe Lorenzo thought was an actual machine where he pressed <laughs> things and the highlights would play and you were on that show very young yes and i so i went there from miami so the funny thing was the woman andrea who i replaced in miami had gone to work for george at the sports machine i found out years later 
George saw me covering racing because his son-in-law watched racing. So he actually saw me on the speed channel, which is why he called me to come there after Andrea left and then he needed a replacement. I, sh- I wanted to show you this. I showed Stu Gotts this. This is what our, I kept this so um, pad of paper because awesome? it's yes. the way, it's it's the way we had Michael to chart football games. Sports like machine. You, oh my God. That is a, you had to chart it. It was the, it's literally like you had to do this. And this is what we turned in. He would assign every one of us a game on Sundays. We would all have to chart it that exact way. We would have to staple it together and we would turn it in after. And that's what our editors cut from like that. I will never have another experience like in a professional setting like that, the way that he ran it. It was such a, a well-oiled machine. And for local news at the time, it was like unreal. Um, Wait, where was I? So anyway, well, so yeah, so you're, I go you're there. You're a rising it, star. You're we all right. got thrown off by George Michael. Yeah, Everyone's got, smiling. We all yeah. swooned I mean, yes. and it was lovely time <laughs> through nostalgia. It was a giant machine. I don't know how to explain it to you, but he would go over and he'd press it and then there'd be highlights. And Lindsay Zarniak goes from Miami. You're still in your early 20s here, right? This is a big national giant job. And you're now a yeah. like starlet sports media person. But so I was, so yeah, so I was doing sports machine with him and I was, also just, you know, the local sports anchor. But my point with that is he was like, Zarniak, you come here. If this is going to be everything you've ever imagined, I'm going to, sh-. he basically was like, I'm going to show you the ropes. I'm going to show you the right way. And at first I had turned that job down because I was scared, but then I, I got some sense and I begged him for it back. And he said, yes. And so I go there and that's what he did. Like it was a boot camp. I mean, it was, I had to read every word of the sports section before I got in there because there would be a quiz. And I remember, I remember the first time that he called me over and was like, Zarniak, what's the energy or the uh, injury that so-and-so has. And I wouldn't have known that if I hadn't read like literally the back page of the paper that morning. And so that was like a small victory. So it was that kind of thing. Like he would, he would like quiz you. Um, but he also, the way that he laid out introductions for me, that mattered. Like the way that he set me up to have a relationship, if I carried it out the correct way with the coaches and the GMs and the, you know, like ownership groups in that town, that made such a difference. And like that, looking back, I'm like, wow, like that is, that's what I want to do for people. However, in the relatable way that I can do it to help with people in their careers, because it really it changed everything. And it, it put me in a position where I was able to, to really learn, you know, and like, and storytell and do it in a great way and get this access. And so anyway, my point with that is in DC, it was like this amazing job. I was also back home, the town, that city. I love that city. It was like a warm hug everywhere I went, you know, it's like, it must be like what Miami is like for you. Damn really. Like, it was just awesome. So when I left there, I was so excited to go to ESPN But it was also like, okay, when I got to ESPN, me and Melvin were about to be married in November, October, whoops. And, um, and we, so we moved there three months before we're getting married and I'm working overnights. He's now a reporter for MSNBC and he's flying everywhere. Like, and I'm dying because I'm in suburban Connecticut and I'm like, what have I done? I'm working overnight, like I'm doing Highlight Express, which no one's seeing, which really doesn't matter. But like at that point, it did because I'm like, I left this amazing experience and now I don't know what's going on. But what happened is I, you know, obviously I stuck it out. I got this opportunity to fill in on the 9 a.m. show on Sports Center a couple of times. And it was like that changed everything. And it was like once that started to happen, it was this amazing experience that was like, oh my God, you have this national playground. Um, But also it was a different experience because I was around a lot of women for the first time. So that was a really great experience overall. But I feel like also, you know, when you get to that level, you're figuring out, okay, it, it was an adrenaline thing. It's like, at ESPN for me doing sports center, you're finding out what shows you're hosting because you're clicking on the calendar that comes up in the in the company email for everyone's calendar to see. And the other thing is you're seeing everyone's calendar. So like that's the thing. You're like, oh, that person's hosting, you know what I mean? So I found out that quickly. Like there was a culture there that like everyone's very much in the same boat. And you're waiting to find out sort of how you're doing and what um what shows you have and that was a great lesson. And like, here's why you don't pay attention to that stuff and just keep your head down. Like me and Melvin talk about it all the time because he experienced the same stuff 
in, you know, doing cable news for the first time. You just freaking do your job. You do you, you keep your head down and you, that all you can do is control that. And you cannot pay attention to all that other stuff. Yeah. It's hard to do that, especially in a business that has this much vanity. I don't know the story of how you ended at ESPN. Oh, <laughs> um, I well, so I was look like it's a story that is I think it I ultimately I think that the decision was timing. It really was timing at the end of it. But no, I'll tell you, I like I was anchoring the six o'clock. And when I got there, I was there for six years. And so I had I was doing Sports Center, and I had a slew of co-hosts and I was lucky that like they were all really fun people. And then for a while, it was me and John Anderson, and he's amazing. He is just one of my favorite people to work with. He's so funny, but it's like a dry funny, which is just so much fun. Um, and he would bring me peppermint patties every night on set right before we started, which was great. And then anyway, I started solo hosting The Six. And The Six was great because when I was doing it, um, I loved that they were starting this big initiative of Sports Center on the Road. You remember that? It was like we would go to, we were the show that happened before a lot of big events. And that's where I really realized I was like, this, like, this is my happy place. Like I love live TV and I love being live, like right, you know, doing a, a pre-show or whatever, just like the drama and anticipation, you know, and we, we found ourselves outside the queue, you know, and, and hopping back and forth to San Francisco for the NBA finals. And so that was really great. But anyway, so I, it was in the summer of 2016, right? Because I was about to have my daughter in November. So I, and I just, I got this feeling like something, it just felt like, I was like, huh, like, you know, when sometimes you're, you're doing your work and there's certain stuff that they're talking about, they would normally be planning. And those conversations for whatever reason kind of weren't happening. So I started to ask like, what's, hey, like what's going on? And um, and then also that kind of coincided with me needing to figure out what stuff looked like when I was coming back from after I had my daughter. So I started asking questions just like, what's, what are we like, what's our plan? And that's when I found out like, actually they might be trying to make a schedule switch. So that just led to a series of meetings, which turned out to be, all right, actually we are, we want to put this new show, which was Mike and Jamel in the 6 p.m. time slot, because that's the slot that makes sense. And so it was, they were just simply needing to make a schedule switch and they wanted me to make a switch to go to the weekends, which, you know, that sports center on the weekends is a great show. I mean, it's a highly, highly rated show. It gets a ton of viewers. It's a great group. But honestly, like at that moment, it was it was the way I found out. And if I hadn't, I, I felt honestly, like after thinking about it for a long time and after, you know, talking to my, my little circle, I was like, that's really effed up. You know, like it's not, I, that's not the choice that I would make to go move to that show at the moment when I'm about to have a child and my husband works on um, during the week. And like, I've never, you know, like, look, I'll be really candid with you. I've always struggled with being open about the balance, right? Between like professional and life. Like I feel like for so long, I will always, I would have always like put forward, no, like professionally, like that's what I would lead with, you know? But like, I, so, so I guess what I mean in like English terms is I always choose, no, I'll be the person that'll do that versus like, I, it, I always get uncomfortable being like, no, I want to go to, to be with my family. Like that makes me just because of what I've been through, I think in the industry, it's just, you learn like that maybe that's not looked at so good, but anyway, so I decided that instead of doing that, that I was going to not do that. And so that was my choice. It was like, you either do the weekends or, or that's it. And so it was a hard decision. It was a really hard decision, but to their credit, like there was a manager there who I loved, who came down to my town, you know, and it's like, let's go to coffee and talk about this and see like, this is really what we want you to do. So they were really open about trying to make it work, but it just, it was not the right move for me. So that was it. So she hosts the SRX <laughs> racing series on CBS. She has a sports and music podcast called the artist and the athlete. We want to talk to her about that, but she's got to get out of here on this note, just real quick. As no. you leave, you mentioned something about your parents wondering why you're still doing this. Were you joking or were you serious? Do they think that you're doing the wrong thing? 
No, no, no. I was joking. No, they love it. They do love it. Um, so no, that was a total joke. In fact, I mean, they, they really enjoy it. <laughs> of course, like they enjoy, you know, they, they loved it when I was in DC. Like, that's the thing that was, a that was the hard thing. Like, I think there are times now that they're like, Hey, come back to DC and do what you're doing. You know what I mean? So no, they've always been really supportive and really great. But, um, but I think it's like, it's one of those things now, what's so fun is to be able to have these opportunities to really do stuff that makes you, you know, like you get to a point in your career and it's like, wow, like this is really awesome. Like this, this kind of work is what I really want to do. So that's why it's super fun. And by the way, um, Ricky Williams was singing your praises. He said something to me when I did the podcast, it was him and be real for the artist and the athlete. And he was like, he was talking about when he decided to leave and to, um, to stop playing. And he was like, Levitard is one of the only people that was really on my side. And he was like, Levitard has this really unique view of what an athlete should be. And he said, and that's why I think I always, he and I are such good friends. Like, what did he mean? And I was like, the next time I can ask you that, I want to ask, because I thought that was so cool and so profound. Oh, I just thought he was ahead of his time in terms of being able to represent and advocate for some things and just the fame machine chewed him up. But I, I really thought that he could have used his power in a way that wouldn't have gotten him vilified and would have gotten him. Uh, I mean, he, he was just on with us last week and he said, I would have been a hero if I had played just now, I would be speaking on behalf of so many wow. people. And, and he, he was just ahead of his time. But they're That's wrapping cool. us up, Lindsay. They've been telling all us right. we've been we've been they're they're yelling at us. They're yep. saying we've got to we've gone too long. So thank well, you. Well, you got all deep. You try to get all deep. That's what happened. Yeah, I know. That's my fault. I'm the grief eater. Thank you for being on with us. I was looking to see what do her parents really hate what she does for a living? But you they, fouled they, it all. Think really she should ex- be a doctor or a lawyer. Or no, <laughs> you were really exploring no. that space. I know. Dan. I know. See you later, Lindsay. Thank you for Bye being guys. on with Thanks, us. Thanks, y'all.